Aloha. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at International Church, where together we aim to help people. We want to help people love God, love people, serve, and engage the world. Thanks for joining us today. Now, I uh, grew up in Europe, but I went to college in Tampa, Florida. I saw some palm trees on the pamphlet. You'll have to forgive me. I didn't know. Uh, Now, Tampa was very hot uh, and not a place I necessarily want to live again. Uh, Hawaii is way, way better. But when I went there, one of the first friends I ever made at freshman orientation was this short little gal named Maria. Now, Maria is, we were in the same dorm together. We went to a campus ministry. We were both involved in in, uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And she's just one of the most compassionate people I have ever been around. And I was one of the main recipients of that. Uh, Having never lived in the U.S. before college, she just was so kind, so warm, uh, very forgiving of my cultural faux pas. I think she just had, you know, compassion for this weird Euro kid uh, who was coming to college. But another group of people that really moved her to compassion was the very large houseless population in Tampa Bay. Now, she and I and a group of friends, we'd be walking, like heading down to Cold Stone, get some ice cream or something, and we'd see somebody begging. Now, we're college students. We didn't have any money. We should be begging. But nonetheless, Marie would go in, and she would sit down, and she'd ask this person, hey, what's your name? Hey, tell me your story. What what brings you out here today? Why are you here? What's going on? And she would just sit down and start talking to this houseless person, and we're like, we're getting ice cream. She's like, yeah, 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 go ahead. I'll catch up. Like, no, we can't leave you with like some strange dude who hasn't showered in two weeks there. We're like, but Marie was just oblivious to any of those dangers because she was just so moved to compassion. She didn't see the dangers. She saw a person here that was hurting, a person that she wanted to get to know, a person she wanted to care about and hear their story and help them. And she did that in in a whole bunch of ways. One of them is she organized a group of us to bring our meal cards. Now, at our, at our college, we had these meal cards that would be updated with 15 meals per week. And so we got these meal cards, and you could use them Monday through Sunday, and they'd expire Sunday night. And none of us used our 15 meal cards because, well, pizza and chipotle. So, you know, we didn't use all 15. And so you organized some of us to come and use our leftover credits in the cafeteria or in the cantina. Uh, and we even had Chick-fil-A on campus. You could go get some food there. we just load up on food and then take it downtown and serve it to those who were hungry and houseless. And the more and more people started joining us and doing that. And it was just awesome and beautiful to be part of this, you know, feeding movement that she really started. Now, Maria ended up switching her degree to social work and has been in that field for over a decade. Currently, she is pursuing a double master's in trauma counseling and international peace and conflict resolution. Now, we're still friends to this day, and I'm glad because Maria is just one of those love-in-action people. Compassion wasn't just a word for her. It wasn't just a, a feeling. Compassion was a motivation Maria believed and lived and demonstrated that love does. Love is active. Love is a verb. Love isn't just a feeling or an emotion. It's something that that cares. Love stops. Love listens. Love helps. Love is sacrificial action. You know, Maria is a lot like Jesus in our passage today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it up to Mark chapter 10. We're going to be at the very end of Mark 10. If you're watching this live online, you can use the church software on that site. Now, in chapters 9 and 10, Jesus has been making his way with his disciples from Galilee down to Jerusalem, but also up to Jerusalem, which is geographically high. And he's worked his way down. He came in through Perea and then went across the Jordan River. And now he's hitting Jericho, which is going to be the last stop on his way to Jerusalem. Now, as we've been noticing that a lot of the things Jesus is saying, the things Jesus is doing in these chapters are about the upstream life that discipleship really is. That if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to do what He does, if we're going to be like Him and follow Him, it means that we're going to be swimming upstream a lot against the the tides of culture, against the, the currents of sin. It means just swimming upstream. Now, this story is the last thing that happens before the triumphal entry 
into Jerusalem. You remember the one on the donkey with the palm branches? We're going to get to that next week. Hope you'll join us for that. But Jericho is the last place before they, you start a 3,500-foot climb up to Jerusalem. So this is the story of blind Bartimaeus. Now, it's a fairly brief text. It's only seven verses. So we're actually going to read through this story twice. Have you ever seen the movie Vantage Point? Uh, it's one that came out in 2008. I don't remember being a huge blockbuster. I think I remember enjoying it. But basically, there's, a, there's an assassination attempt or some kind of action thing that happens. And you watch that action, that assassination or attack, uh, from multiple angles and different times, different people's vantage points. And every time you watch it, you, of course, get more information, figure out who the bad guy is and who did it. Well, today, we're going to do a little bit of that. We're going to read this story the first time through from the perspective of the blind man. And the second time, we're going to take Jesus' vantage point. We're going to walk through this story in both of their shoes. Now, my high school PE teacher once said that before you judge someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes because then you're a mile away and you have their shoes. Now, to help us maybe gain a little bit better perspective into Bartimaeus' uh, life, I've, I've brought this along. Now, if I keep them like this, I'm not going to be able to read the text. So, I'm going to put it up here. And uh, I certainly don't mean any offense uh, of this against anybody who has trouble seeing or disabled. I just wanted a visual thing for you to look at, that we are taking this story from Bartimaeus's perspective. Read along with me, if you will, please. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, they being Jesus and his disciples. And as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, he was sitting by the roadside begging. Now, there is no social welfare system in first century Palestine, right? So if you're a blind person and no one wanted to take care of you, then you didn't get taken care of. That's just how it worked. And unfortunately, the way that the society was so stratified, beggars were at the very bottom of the social ladder. Now, verse 47, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he just shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. No, the crowd tells him to be quiet, right? They're like, dude, shh, hey, man, you are embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing us. This is not how we behave in Jericho. Be quiet. But he just gets all the louder, right? And he just keeps crying out. And it's really interesting that Bartimaeus calls him the son of David. See, that's actually a title that we haven't come across yet. Nobody has called Jesus the son of David so far in the Gospel of Mark. Now, the son of David was a title that people used to describe that coming king, the one who would rule on David's throne forever, right? The Messiah, the one who would free them and rule over them forever. Well, Bartimaeus is identifying Jesus of Nazareth with that son of David, right? He's putting the pieces together. And it's fascinating because almost no one else seems to know this. No one else seems to understand Jesus' true identity, that he's the Messiah. He is the King of Kings. They don't understand that yet. So there's incredible irony here that it's the blind man is the one who clearly sees Jesus' true identity. The blind beggar is the one with special spiritual insight. Verse 49. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called out to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And that is amazing. Yes, Jesus did hear his cry. You know an amazing thing? Jesus hears ours too. Jesus hears our cries. How encouraging is that, that this is our God. Our God wrapped in flesh has time and concern for the most lowly person in society. He has time and concern and care for you and for me. 
Our God always has his ears and his eyes tuned to his people. Psalm 17, 6 says, I call on you, my God, because you will answer me. Listen closely. Hear what I say. Psalm 54, 2 says, God, hear my prayer. Listen to the words of my mouth. Psalm 71, 2 says, in your justice, rescue me and deliver. Listen closely to me and save me. How amazing is it that we have a God who saves us and who listens closely to us? How wonderful do we, is that we have a God, a Savior, who loves and cares about every single one of His children. Because one thing I think we can take from this text is that Jesus will do for us what He does for Bartimaeus. He will stop. He will listen. He will care. And then He'll call out to us. He'll invite us to Himself Now, how we respond to that is, of course, up to us. How does Bartimaeus respond? Verse 50, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet, came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. What a powerful moment that is. I mean, I know it might seem obvious to us, especially those of us who know, like, the rest of of the story. Like, um, Jesus, what does he need? Well, Jesus, he's, he's blind. Like, I think he needs you to do something about that. It's a little obvious. But is it? Is that what Bartimaeus wanted? Is that what he wants? Maybe Bartimaeus just wants to hit Jesus up for some money. Maybe he just wants to ask for, you know, some, some money to go get some food. Or maybe he wants Jesus to just bless him. Or, Jesus, will you pray for him? Maybe he's just going to ask Jesus for a new cloak, or maybe he's going to ask Jesus, hey, when you become king, would you, like, just remember the poor? Would you maybe have some social reforms, change the welfare system a little bit, remember us? He could want any number of things from Jesus. What does Bartimaeus want? Jesus doesn't assume the answer to that question. What mercy does he seek? Jesus lets him answer, what do you want from me? And the blind man said, Mark 10, 51, I want to see. Whoa. He wants to see. He's not asking for a handout. He's not asking for just a little bit of help. Bartimaeus is asking for a miracle. Bartimaeus is asking for the impossible here. What boldness. He calls out to Jesus and he asks him for a miracle, for healing. He wants to see. What do you want? Rabbi, I want to see. You know, a few verses back, Jesus asked James and John the exact same question. What do you want me to do for you? And James and John answered that question by asking for, well, we want more glory. We would like position. We would like pride and, you know, some influence. We'd like some power. Jesus had to rebuke them Is that what Jesus is going to do with Bartimaeus? Hey, hey, what you're asking for is impossible, buddy. I don't just just make blind people see. That's just not something that happens. That's not normal. Here's a cloak. No, Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus sees incredible faith here. Bartimaeus just wants to see. He wants to glimpse reality. He wants to view things as they really are. He's asking for healing. He's asking for health. He's asking for, for wholeness. And in verse 52, go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight, and he followed Jesus along the road. What does he do? Jesus heals him, and he can see instantly. Don't need that anymore. The first eyes that Bartimaeus sees are the eyes of his creator. Have you ever thought about that? What amazing. The first eyes you see are the eyes of God. That's amazing. I think it shows us so many things. You know, I know we compared Bartimaeus just now to James and John because there's that similar question with Jesus, but I think we can also compare him to the rich young ruler. Now, you may have to go back another page in your Bible. This, we talked about this guy a couple of weeks ago. 
The rich young ruler came to Jesus wanting to know what it took to be saved, and Jesus said, you need to give up your your moral superiority, this life of self that you have built for yourself, this your greed, your position, your money, give that up and come follow me. And of course, that guy couldn't do it. He was too prideful, too rich, too self-reliant to follow Jesus. He could not let go of his wealth of his moral goodness, of all his possessions. So that guy went away sad. Jesus told him to follow me, yet that guy went away sad. And here, how does Bartimaeus respond to the call to come to Jesus? He throws his cloak, probably his only meaningful possession. He throws it away and comes after Jesus. He comes with no pretense, He comes with no position. He comes with no moral resume. He comes with nothing. He just comes with his need. He comes realizing that he is fully reliant on Jesus for help. And Jesus responds to that faith with the impossible, with a miracle. He told told him, your faith has healed you. He gets healing. And instead of, Jesus told him, go, your faith has healed you. And instead of this guy obeying Jesus and actually running off to go see the world, I'm going to go travel to Paris, I'm going to go see all the things I've missed, he doesn't. He doesn't go anywhere. He wants to stay with Jesus. Instead of walking away sad, he becomes a joy-filled Jesus follower. See, Bartimaeus just shows us once more how upstream the kingdom of God really is. How upside down the values are in the kingdom of God. It's not the rich and it's not the self-sufficient who are rewarded. It is the humble. It is the lowly. It is the poor and the broken. See, Christ has plenty of need or plenty of mercy to give to all, but mercy is only for the needy. Those who don't come to Jesus for mercy, like the rich young ruler, they're not going to get it. Mercy is only for the needy, only for those who recognize their need. And we need to all recognize our need, because the truth is that we are all spiritually blind, every single one of us, unless Jesus gives us sight, unless He opens our eyes to see reality, to see things as they really are, to see Him for who He truly is. And we're going to remain blinded in darkness. And so if you say, I'm somebody, I need help. I'm in need of mercy. Great. That is a necessary requirement to receive mercy, is to be somebody who comes to Jesus needy. And if we want to receive God's grace, if we want His healing and His, His help, His mercy, His forgiveness to come to our life, then we actually need to do what Bartimaeus does. First thing he does is he recognizes correctly who Jesus is. He recognizes he is the son of David. He is the son of God. This is the king of kings. Secondly, we need to recognize who we are, that we are spiritual beggars in need, that we don't have what it takes, that we are not self-sufficient. We are insufficient. Only Christ is sufficient. He is what we need. We are spiritual beggars in need of salvation, and we come to Him for help, admit that we are needy. And thirdly, we come to Him and receive that mercy, right? Recognize who He is, recognize who we are, and then come for mercy and for healing. Come for hope. We bring to Him nothing but our weakness, but our shame, but our brokenness and our sin, and He meets us with grace, with mercy, with power, and with blessing. And then He invites us says, you are welcome to join Jesus on this journey. We get to follow Him as closely as we want to on this thing called discipleship. Praise God. We praise God that He had time for Bartimaeus, that He has time for you and for me. And nothing has changed in 2,000 years, friends. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. God still offers mercy to the needy. Jesus still hears, stops, and helps anyone who will call on His name. So will you call on His name? Will you come to Him with your hurts? Will you call to Him and recognize your need and say, Jesus, I need you to help and to heal me? 
Like poor blind Bartimaeus, no one who comes to Christ is disappointed. We can cry out to Him, and we can invite others to cry out to Him too. D.T. Niles, who's a pastor in Sri Lanka, he once shared this idea. He said, evangelism is like one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. That's where we are. We are all Bartimaeuses telling other Bartimaeuses where they can get healing, where they can be sight only through the hands of Jesus. And that's what we can learn from Bartimaeus, that it does not matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you're from, who you are, who your family is, it doesn't matter what sins you've committed, what pain you are in, what healing you need, Jesus can do the miraculous. He can do the impossible. He has bread for beggars. He has mercy for needy. If only we will call out to Him today. But now let's switch gears and say, okay, well, what can we learn about discipleship and the upstream swim in this story from Jesus? Yes, Jesus is represented by a white bathrobe. Just read Revelation. He's wearing a white robe. No, I did not dip this one in blood. That's weird. Ew, gross. Plus, as Christians, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, so... It seems to fit. We're going to go with the robe. Robe. Jesus. All right. What do we learn if we walk through the story a second time and see things from his perspective? Read again with me back in verse 46. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When, they heard, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. Now, Jesus is on mission. I mean, like, these are his final days before the cross. He's being crucified probably within a week of this happening. He is focused on Jerusalem. He's kind of focused on getting there. This is the culmination of, of his mission. This is what he's come to do. Like, Jesus is on his death march right now. His mind must have just been racing as he hits Jericho. His heart must have been beating 100 miles an hour as he sees the sign, Jericho or Jerusalem, 17 miles ahead. And we could certainly understand if Jesus just moved on, even just this one time, like, Jesus, you got a lot on your plate. You can just ignore this one. Just keep on going. Just act like you didn't hear him and just keep walking. But he doesn't. And we could say Jesus had more important things on his mind, right? He's about to give his life for the sins of the world on a cross, he has this caravan of pilgrims, and he tells him, whoa, stop. Whoever's calling to me, bring that person to me. He stops everyone so he can stop and help the one. Just one lowly blind beggar. What Jesus here is doing is Jesus taught his disciples the art of stopping. On October 20th, 2011, it was a Thursday, a little two-year-old girl named Yue Yue was struck by a van in a, in a hit-and-run accident in China. After that, at least 18 people passed her body by laying in the street, many of them stepping over her or around her just to avoid her. She was then struck by a second van that also did not stop and kept going. She was finally helped by a trash collector, but it was tragically too late. Little Yue Yue was declared brain dead in the hospital the next day. Now, the reason we know this is because this whole incident was actually caught on video. It was shocking 
to the moral sensibilities of the world. It brought a heavy sense of shame on China and to those involved, recognizing this is a nation that has devalued young girls over young boys forever, choosing selective abortions and now having designer babies. You have the problem of having 37 million too few girls. One of the passerbys later identified themselves, and they said in an interview, well, this wasn't my child. Why should I bother? Now, when we hear that, we have to ask ourselves, would we have cared enough to stop and help little Yue Yue? I can tell you this for sure. Jesus would have. Jesus did. Just ask Bartimaeus. What about us? Do we have ears to hear in our lives? Are we so busy that the needs of friends, of neighbors, let alone strangers, aren't going to reach our ears, that they're going to go unnoticed? Do we care? Do we hear and stop? Are we just too busy with our own lives, with our own families, with our own problems? Are we too focused on our mission that we miss out on the hurting people all around us? Last week, Josh shared that he realized he needed to pick up the slack at home in the chore department if he was going to teach on serving with, you know, any kind of integrity. And uh, I had a similar experience to that this week. Like many of you, I've mostly been working from home. I've rarely come into the, the church office, but this week I needed to come in for a couple of hours. And it happened to be that in that very small window of time that a local houseless person came to the church office door and banged on it. Can I be honest and just say, I had a lot to do. There's a lot that I still didn't get done. Uh, I didn't really want to hang out with this guy. I did not really want to talk with him. Like, I didn't know if he's coming off some bender, what he's going to ask for. I really didn't want to feel like listening to his story. I didn't want to take an hour and just, you know do this. I wanted to get back to my mission, right? I wanted to get back to that always growing to-do list and knock some of that stuff out. But the Holy Spirit just whispered to me in that moment saying, Scott, are you too busy for a stranger who is coming to you for help? Scott, are you too self-centered to help this guy? Are your eyes so focused on the mission that's 17 miles ahead of you that you're not paying attention to the hurting people around you? Oh, and Scott, in case you're wondering, Jesus' mission was way more important than yours. Because yes, Jesus cared. Jesus heard. Jesus stopped. Jesus called Bartimaeus to himself. And if we are going to be his followers, we cannot do any less than that either. But Jesus didn't stop there either with Bartimaeus. He actually goes further. Read on. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. All right, you get what you want. Come to Jesus. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. See, Jesus wasn't too busy to hear and to stop he actually goes even further. He listens to the man. What what do you want me to do for you? What do you need? What's going on in your life? Bartimaeus, tell me your story. He gives this blind beggar his undivided attention. Bartimaeus can say anything he wants to at this point. Jesus is listening. He's paying attention to him. He's showing him how much he cares for him, a fellow image bearer of God. Then after Jesus hears the man's request, he helps. That order is very important. Do we listen? Do we listen? Or do we just dive right in when we're trying to help somebody, assuming that we have all the answers, that we know what's going on? Do we assume that we know what people need in their lives? Do we treat people like problems to be solved and out of the way, boxes to be checked? Or do we treat them as fellow image bearers, beloved by God? Do we give them dignity 
Do we give them our undivided attention? Do we listen to them? Someone that caused me to stop and listen last week was the story of Ahmad Arbery. You probably heard his story. He's a 25-year-old black man who was shot by two white men in Georgia, ultimately because he looked suspicious while jogging through their mostly white neighborhood. And I listened with grief as my black and brown friends mourned over the senseless loss of another person of color, another name in a very long list of victims of racism. Now, I am not saying that because I listened, I now know how to help. I now have the answers. I know how to solve racism. No, not not at all. I, I don't know. But what I can do is I can stop. I can care. I can listen. I can learn. And once I find out how I might be able to help, then I do what I can to help. Because I think it is so crucial that Jesus asked a question first. So often, we Christians, we come into a situation with just like righteous guns ablazing. We come in with answers to questions that nobody is asking. We sometimes come in so quick to help that we don't stop to listen first. We don't analyze and ask and care and say, hey, is this most helpful? Is this what you need? And this is especially common in the way Christians sometimes do missions and local outreach. Right? We're so eager to serve and to help that we just jump right in. We go to that foreign third world country and we paint that church building for the fourth time this year. Often, When we go to help as Christians, we actually do more harm than good. Sometimes our helping hurts. Sometimes our charity is toxic. What we need to do better is listen. Let's listen to people. Let's let somebody who's hurting tell us what they need instead of assuming that we're above them and we know. We have all the answers. No, we don't. Let someone tell you what their needs are. Then figure out together what you might be able to do, what would be most helpful. That's what Jesus models for us here. And then the blind man says, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. Jesus helps. Eyesight, that's obviously a problem. Jesus can fix It's probably not something I could fix, but maybe there's something else you and I could have done in that situation to help. But have you ever stopped and asked, like, why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus help? What motivates Him to care, to stop, to listen, and to help? That's one word, love. Love does Like my friend Maria, Jesus' love is not limited to a feeling. It's not limited to just something that, you know, you feel and ah, you feel love. No. No, love is active. Love is sacrificial action. Love does. Now, the phrase love does is not original to me. But ever since I first heard it, it's always stuck in my brain. It's actually the title of a book by Bob Goff. And I would highly encourage you to read this book sometime. Bob is actually a lawyer from Southern California who loves Jesus. And because he loves Jesus, he just goes on these crazy faith-filled adventures. And his book is just amazing stories of things God does around him, in him, through him. It's just awesome to to read. Uh, You will be encouraged, you will laugh, you will cry, and you will learn a lot if you read the book Love Does by Bob Goff. And in the introduction, Bob writes this. He says, love is never stationary. In the end, love doesn't just keep thinking or planning, where some of us sometimes get stuck. Simply put, love does. Love is sacrificial action. And as Jesus' disciples, we need to follow in His footsteps in the way of, of active love. And this is important to us at International Church, which is why our our mission statement is that we want to help you, help people. Do what? Well, love God, right? That's easy. But love God, serve, and engage the world, those are hard, right? Like loving people, serving them, engaging with them. Well, that takes growth. That takes training. That takes discipleship. And that takes some, some upstream swimming, 
sometimes, right? Because sometimes doing love means being inconvenienced. It means stopping. It means sacrificing your to-do list in order to help somebody else. Sometimes doing love means swimming upstream. It means stopping when the crowd wants to kind of keep moving. It means listening when the crowd keeps shushing. It means loving when the crowd keeps ignoring. It means serving when the crowd just wants to be all about themselves. It means caring. It means caring for the least, the last, and the lost on Oahu and around the world. Why does it mean that? Because love does. Jesus is our model for this. Now, if you're at all like me, I'm a task person, I'm like, all right, we'll go do love. Oh, man. That's a, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot to do. When I think of this example and the call to imitate Christ, I'm overwhelmed. I'm like, I don't deserve to wear this robe. I can't be Jesus. I'm insufficient for this task. I'm just one person. I mean, does, does God know how many houseless people there are on Oahu? There's a lot. Right? Does God know how many jobless people there are right now who are in need? Does God know there's a pandemic? I really can't stop and help in a pandemic. Does God know that there's, you know, everybody's got problems? Everyone's hurting. What makes that person any special? And because the need is so great, I find my self-justification trying to rise up and go, well, here's why you, you can't and won't and don't have to help. Scott, because, well, it's impossible. The need is too great. And so what I do is I see the great need, and so I'm like, I don't know what to do or where to even start helping, so I'm just going to do nothing. <laughs> I'll just shut down. It's easier. The need can easily overwhelm us. That's just a fact. There are near infinite amount of needs, and we are finite people with finite resources. So the need can and will overwhelm us, but we are not the Savior. Jesus is. And we need to remember this, that yes, love does, but love does one at a time. Love does one at a time. Jesus didn't heal every single person in the crowd of all their pains, all their ailments, all their issues. He didn't take care of everybody in one fell swoop. He didn't take care of everybody in Israel during his ministry, right? We see the disciples having to heal people in Jerusalem who have been crippled their whole life. Well, how come Jesus didn't heal it? He didn't heal every single person. But here we see he heals the one, the one who called out to him. Anyone who came to Jesus for healing was healed. He calls out and Jesus helps him. He helps the one in need. See, the best way to offer love and help is just one person at a time. It's just one at a time. I once heard a pastor at a leadership conference say, hey, pastors, you have your congregation that you're trying to serve and take care of. It's so easy to get overwhelmed, be like, well, I, I can't take care of everybody, so you know, I can't call everybody, I can't check on everybody, so I'm just going to check in on nobody. He says, no, 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 no. Do for the one what you wish you could do for all. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Yes, it's true. You and I, we can't help everybody. But we can't help somebody. And that will make a difference, right? We cannot do everything, but we can do something. We may not be able to do great things, but we can do small things with great love. We can, because love does one at a time. So today, as we wrap up this message, I just ask you, is there some one, is there a one that is coming to your mind right now? Is there someone you know who needs compassion and love? Is there someone you know who needs you to stop, to listen, and to help? Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe a beggar, maybe a jobless person, someone who's sick, maybe someone who's lonely. Who is your one this week. And if no one's coming to your mind, would you do this? Would you commit to keeping your eyes and your ears open for that one who needs you to do love, who needs you to show compassion and care? Will you listen for someone's cry? Because I'm willing to bet that if you're willing 
to do love this week, then Jesus is going to bring you within earshot of a blind beggar sometime this week. Because God often reveals His heart through our hands. That's what He wants us to do. He shows who He is and what He cares about through His people, through our acts of love, our acts of kindness. This week, start with one. Who's your one? Love does one at a time. Just do for one what you wish you could do for all. And let Jesus do the rest. Just start with one. Because love does one at a time. Let's pray together. Lord God, we admit that we are weak, that we are insufficient for the mission and the task that you have given us. But God, where we are weak, you are strong. Where we are not enough, your word tells us that you, Christ, are enough. And God, I pray that you would help us to be like you. You are a God who is just reckless with your love and your compassion. You give it freely. You don't hold back grace. You throw grace upon grace. You give mercy to all who call on you. Lord, may we be beggars who come to you for help, for mercy, for grace, for salvation itself, knowing that only you can give us eternal life through your Son, Jesus. And Lord, may we also, as your people, be dispensers of your grace and your mercy Would you help us to love recklessly as you do? Help us to love just one person at a time this week. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.